Ah, you can you you can see my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe it? I found this on the internet just like it oh, is. Oh, that's great. When I saw it, I said, I gotta have that. <laughs> All right, we're gonna talk about balance tonight. Everybody thinks that you have to have a balance on an antenna. And in certain uh uh, certain applications, that's true. Uh, but they're not necessary. Uh, as you see on this table right here, there are all kinds of balance. There's one I made up. I don't remember now whether it's a 2-to-1, 4-to-1, 1-to-1, I don't remember. There's a 9-to-1 that I made and sealed in uh, this one is a. Uh, mm, I did mark. And there's a four to one. And here you have. Here you have. Don Straw. <laughs> here you have com 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 commercial balance. Uh, that one's obvious. It's so clean and nice. It's never been used. This one's been up a while and taken down. Uh, and you can come look at these. And this is the reason why not every antenna needs a balance. If you see this one, you see the black mark there. It got over, the current got a little high and it burned it and it went bad and the antenna had to be taken down and redone. And of course, nobody checks the balance. The whole wire had to thin down. Yeah, well, you had to because it's, it's in the center. It's one of these. Uh, one of these, so okay. yeah, take it down. Everybody checks the wire, make sure nothing's broke, checks the coax, you know. I don't know what's wrong with that thing. And so then they look at the balance, and that's what happened in that one. And that's one I took out of a of one that got run over by somebody, so I took it apart just so I'd have one that was good. Uh, so these are them. You can take them. Look at them. I'll put that cover back in the box. It'd um, do good to have an extra one of those on hand, wouldn't you? It wouldn't hurt. Now, you can build them. All these, these, this one's my built, this one I built, this one I built. This one's 119 bucks. Uh, I forget what this one was. Uh, of course, these were made for specifics. This, this particular, this particular ballon right here is made for a in fed antenna. This is made specifically for an in fed lawnmower. Uh, so, and, and they work real well. I've got two of these out at the radio station out at the base and they work fantastic. This one I bought uh, uh, for my horizontal loop. I was going to put up a second horizontal loop, and I just haven't done it. Uh, and these I built for, I don't remember now why I built this. Is, this 9 to 1 is, uh, of course, it weighs a ton. It's designed to take a full kilowatt. So it's got, uh, it's got two of these. Toroids in there to take the current and everything else. Uh, because the uh, if you feed a, if you feed a horizontal loop with with uh, 450 ohm ladder line, then this brings that impedance of that antenna down closer to 40 ohm. I mean 50 ohms, so that you can uh, uh, match it a little easier. Most people just use a four to one and bring, still brings it down to where most tuners will handle it. Some tuners will not handle uh, tremendous mismatches, especially the ones that come in the radios that you buy. Uh, that's why I use everything I've got. I use an external tuner on everything. I don't use the one that's in the radio because it's designed 
it's designed specifically just for the hand bands and uh, antennas that are close to resonance. So I use a lot of stuff outside of the hand bands, being with the, uh, with the military Mars organization. So I have stuff on a totally different frequencies, and so I use an external tuner. All right. Fallon is an electric transformer that couples two sides of an electrical circuit. Okay, now, obviously, why does it have the name Balan? Does anybody know? Yes? It's two words, balance to unbalance. That's right. They are, that's exactly what they do. They take a balanced, uh, they take a balanced input to an unbalanced antenna. Okay, and that's what, that's, that's, that's what it's supposed to do. Okay. Now you see, you'll see, you'll hear something else called an un-un. And that's an unbalanced unbalance. And that's mo mostly used, that's mostly used with verticals. I have a, I have, I should have brought that with me tonight. I have an un-un that I use with my big vertical that I put up on field day. One side of the electrical circuit contains an electrical signal that is balanced with respect to electrical ground, and the other side of the circuit contains unbalanced electrical signal. Merging the two sides gives the balance its name. Uh, they are typically used to produce maximum power transfer by matching the impedance on one side of the circuit with the impedance on the other side. Now, what I have found in my several years of, of, of antenna work, that balans do that, but there is power consumed in this balance. Okay? What these meters are that you see right here, uh, these are RFM meters. If you put this in the circuit and uh, key down, you're going to see uh, deflection in this. And that is the current, the RF current going through this meter out to the antenna. So if you put this on an antenna, say a long wire, let's just say a long wire for right now, and uh, you measure the RF current, and then you put a ballon in there, and you're going to find that that RF current goes down. And what I have found is that a ballon swallows up somewhere around 25% of the power that you put through it. Which means if you've got a 100 watt radio and you transmit in a, in an antenna that's got a ballon on it, you're only going to get 75 watts out at the antenna. So, if you don't have to have a balance, I don't recommend, I don't run any balance on except where I'm trying to match the antenna, get the impedance down to where I can, where I can uh, uh, handle it better, especially through a tube amplifier. Uh, now you want to know why I have three of these. This one reads from zero to one amp. This one reads zero to three amps. And this one runs zero to 10 amps. Now this is strictly comes out of a airborne radio in, a, in an aircraft. In an aircraft, that's how they measured the, um, they tuned till they got maximum RF power out. Don't know what the SWR was. They didn't have watt meters in there. They just measured until the, the RF amperage was as far up as it could go. This one, if you look at the connections, came strictly out of a airborne radio. Uh, I found that found out a ham fest someplace, uh, and I built these myself. Uh, and I know, and I and I didn't get the grand idea to check that. Pat Lane and I were discussing antennas one day, and uh, we were we were on a Mars exercise. And so I set my antenna up and I went to put a ballon on it. He said, what are you doing that for? <laughs> I 
So we got to talking about it. He pulled his RFM meter out and we put it on there and found that. And I said, hmm, it might be a good test piece of test gear to have. So I built them. Uh, and uh, so, and that, that holds pretty holds true to any antenna I've put that on. About 20, 20 to 25% power is absorbed by the ballon. Yes. So you don't have to have a ballon on the loop? You don't have to. Okay. Okay. Problem with the loop is the uh, the problem you run into on the loop and some antennas is the uh, in input impedance. Um, on a on a loop antenna, the input impedance can be up into the uh, very high, um, and some depending upon how it's made and what it is, can get almost to a thousand ohms. And most uh, uh, most. Uh, tuners in the radio or even external tuners might handle six or seven hundred ohms. So you put a ballon in on a loop like that to bring that impedance down so that your tuner can handle it. You know, years ago, us old timers, we didn't ever, we never had tuners, we very seldom ever, you ever set, set, very seldom ever saw one of us old folks have a tuner. And the reason was that we had tube radios. And the tube radios could handle from about 40 ohms, well, and I'll take that, probably a little lower than that, probably 25, 30 ohms to about 120, 150 ohms. Because on your, on your tube radios, you had, a, uh, you had a tune control that you tuned the final amplifier to resonance and then you had a load control that basically matched the antenna impedance to the radio, to the output. You don't have that on transistor. Transistors are 50 ohms and that's it, man. Uh, you anything over 50 ohms, you're gonna generate enough heat to fry the transistor. One of the reasons that these newer radios have uh, uh, cutback circuits or foldback circuits. When the SWR goes up, they cut the power to the final so they don't get hot. Transistors don't like heat. That's why they big heat sinks on these radios and everything else, fans. You didn't have that on the old tube radios. Matter of fact, you could almost fry eggs <laughs> over the finals on them old tube radios. So, is a ballon necessary? Yes and no. Um, if you if you build a if you build a radio well let's if you build an antenna to resonate on a particular frequency then you don't need a ballon unless you're getting RF problems okay RF coming back in your shack and that's usually because you didn't do something right uh, this uh, <clears throat> these uh, in fed in fed wires. This is supposed to be mounted down next to the ground, okay? If you mount it further than say 15, 20 feet from the ground and don't have a good ground, this thing is gonna put RF back on the coax and it's gonna be all run all over your shack. And there you're gonna have to have a choke, choke that RF out. So this needs to go right close to where the ground is. That's why you got a nice ground connector. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna go back on the car. I had that problem out at the Navy base, because we're on the second floor. I ran a nice number six copper ground all the way from the second floor down to the ground and drove a nice eight foot, eight foot ground rod. Did, all the, did, all, did it all right. But I still had RF because that ground was long and the coax was a better ground to the ballon and so it put it back out on the coax and it came right in the shack and lights flickered and everything else. So I had to spend another hundred dollars for, for a choke, put the choke on it and the RF was gone. So you gotta be careful. But that's one of the, that's one of the things that a, that a one to one ballon will do if you put it on a, on a dipole. Problem is, most people put up a dipole and they want to they want to run the whole ham band on that dipole, and you can do it. 
but your ballon won't like it. That one that's burnt is probably the reason that one's burnt is because somebody loaded it up on a one of the other hand bands and it, the, the current got too too high in that particular ballon and it burned. So you just don't uh, you, you gotta you gotta think if you're gonna try to use it for a multi-band antenna then you really don't want a ballon. Yes. All right. Forgive me. I'm... That's okay. All right. I, I've been running on the vertical uh, bustle, uh, mm -hmm. five, but I'm getting ready to put up the delta loop. Okay. And my goal was to run 10, 15, 20, 40, and 80. You're going to put up a big loop. 264 okay. feet. Okay. Okay. You're going to do it vertical? Or are you going to do a, you're going to do a horizontal right. okay horizontal. now we're we're cooking oh <laughs> uh, i've got trees i'm going to hang it so you, you should you should succeed at first yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's the reason why i'm asking i read his t-shirt when i walked in <laughs> okay well let, let let me let let me let me uh i have a i have a uh about a 215 foot Horizontal loop fed with about 40 feet of uh, 450 ohm ladder line to a four to one. Matter of fact, that's what that's exactly what that's exactly what this is for. That's a four to one ballon, three kW power level. And the only reason I've used it, and I use it at the end of the 450 ohm ladder line, to bring the impedance down to where my tuners don't sit there until they finally find a place they're happy, okay? So that's the case that you need to have a balance, okay? Uh, and I forget, I can't remember all this stuff, I'm old. Uh, I can't, I don't, I think, <coughs> I think the, uh, uh, a, uh, Horizontal loop, a one length, one uh, wavelength horizontal loop on a resonant frequency. The input impedance is somewhere between four and six hundred ohms. Okay. So, uh, if you got a four to one balance on there, you take that six hundred ohms, then you're gonna you're gonna cut it down to about a hundred and fifty ohms, which which ought to, tuners ought to handle that just fine. Uh, you could put a nine to one on it and bring it right down close to 50 ohms. Okay. Another. Okay, go I've ahead. I've got 150 feet of coax going out to where it's going to be. You need to throw that 150 feet of coax away and put up some 450 ohm ladder on it. And I'll tell you why. The loss in that 150 feet of coax even uh, now down on 80 meters it probably would be negligible but up on 10 15 20 you can look at three three to four db loss you're going to cut your signal in half both transmit and receive and that has nothing to do with impedance that has to that has strictly has to do with loss what size coax are you going to run well right right now it's running on the vertical uh it's uh, uh, 213. 213, okay, well that's good because that's that's the least lossy piece of coax you could put on there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people on that would run 58 and you're talking it's probably close to six to eight dB loss with that. I got pretty good on the vertical. I've, I've talked to Japan and Australia and London. And... Well, it, you know, even at that loss, mm -hmm. uh, you uh, it'll perform. Uh, and but it will perform better if you can get rid of as much of that loss as you can. Thing you got to think about on that, if you use that 450 ohm ladder line, that's going to become part of the antenna. So that's going to that's going to put a if you the length that you've got up there is supposedly the resonant length. Mm -hmm. uh, then you add that much ladder line, it's going to add that much to it. So be careful. 
It'll work. But I need to but I need to reduce my my you, wire. You don't I'm too well sure yeah, if you can, if you can, you ought you need to take into consideration that that four hundred and fifty ohm, and that's two wires that goes out mm -hmm. and goes to the antenna, so that's gonna be become part of the antenna. And the coax does too, but it's shielded. It doesn't have quite as much effect on it. I ran I ran a, uh, a horizontal loop for 3.3 .3 megacycles, okay, which is below the 80 meter band. And I ran it, but I used a piece of 75 ohm coax uh, RF match. In other words, if you were in here where I talked about uh, phasing lines, that's what I did. I built a 75 ohm phasing line for 3.3 .3 megahertz. That it was a matching section, actually, is what it ended up doing. And, uh, and I had a pretty good antenna. Uh, but, it, it, you know, if I, if I ventured very far off of that 3.3, .3, it got to be kind of squirrely. I was trying to use it for 4 megs, too. And uh, it just did not work. So the loop I've got up now is for 4 megs. And uh, it, works, it works rather well. Uh, so... You know, you, you, you got you, you, you got to take in the, all this into consideration. I, I just love these these uh, advertisements for commercial antennas. Work the entire hand band, no tuner necessary, and that's the biggest lie in the world. Uh, it might, if you look at how the hand bands are set up, there may be a frequency in there that would be resonant. On, or a length of antenna that may be resonant on every one of those, but one frequency and one frequency only. So it's and, and so I guess they can get out of the they can get uh, by with the federal communications. I mean, with the uh, uh, consumer people because there is one frequency in there that might be might be resonant on all four bands that they could use. It. So uh, you just got to be careful. All right, let's go. Let's uh, where are we going here? <clears throat> one last question about balance. Sure. <clears throat> Nine to one, four to one, or other weird ratios. Same power loss, twenty-five percent. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, you gotta. You, well, we, we'll get into a diagram here. Right. Uh, okay. Balance has only two jobs. Two jobs. Isolate the transmission line. In other words, keep RF from coming back down the, the, the transmission line. And provide a balanced output current. That's that's all it is. Okay. Uh, misconceptions. Balance will not improve SWR. The exception is where a balance is used as part of a matching network, i.e., four to one balance in loops. Okay. They are not lightning arresters. Uh, the winding in inductance is far too low. You saw the burn one. That could have been a lightning strike to actually burn that one. I don't know what it was. Uh, Built-in spark gaps don't work. The radio equipment is destroyed long before the gap is ever arced over. Okay. Do not allow multi-band operation on a single band coax fan antennas. They do not make the antennas more broadband. Now you can work multi bands with a ballon in there, but the performance would be a whole lot better if you took that ballon out of there. There are general; these are all generalizations for it. There may be specific exceptions to any one of them, but as a rule, you cannot do a multi band on an antenna that's got a ballon in it. You can, but performance suffers, and you end up burning. You could end up burning, burning the ballon up. Right there. Okay, here's a one to one choke bar uh, balance. They call it the ugly balance. And that's just coax wrapped around a piece of PVC pipe. Okay? And it's strictly, if it's a choke balance, it's strictly to choke off something. And it's usually RF coming back down the uh, uh, coax. Uh, 
and it just depends. You can go on the internet and look up balance and all this stuff. You've got to, you can find out all the information, how little, how much length ought to be on that. Uh, let's see, is my little, uh, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. How long these, this ought to be. You can find that on the internet. I think it says here 18 to 21 feet. Uh, you just keep wrapping it until you lose, to it gets rid of the RF. Okay, here is, what is that's a four to one balance, four to one balance on a piece of toroid. It's about 10, what do they show here? Two, three, four, five, six, about seven turns, two, uh, two turns, and you're about, oop, hit the wrong button. Your balance, is here, and if you see that, it goes all the way right around, it comes out here, then it goes to ground. So you got, you got a, there's where part of your, part of the, the load goes. And you got from the hop to the ground, and you got current going through there, it's gonna be used up somewhere. And then the unbalance, again, goes through there, it comes out and goes the unbalance. But it's also, uh, I'm sorry, it goes to the other side of that and balance, and then that's how that's how it works. I'm not going to get into chasing the electrons, but that's 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 the winding. And if you look at if you look at this one, that's just about. I think that's a four to one that I built here. You see, it looks very simple, but it's ten turns, and I think that's what the this is not telling you. I forget what it is, but it's got a lot more turns than 10. I forget what I built that one for. Uh, depends on who's building it and what they have. A lot, of, a, lot of the stuff you, a lot of the stuff that you see on the internet uh, about different things, guys write about it because they built it and it worked for them. may not necessarily work for you. And you may do it a different way and it works great for you but a name may not work for you, but so a lot of this stuff that you're building on your own, uh, uh, like I say, in your situation, where your radio is, how you, how high it is off the ground, what's close around, is there any power lines, or, may work fine for you, but you give it to somebody who's out in the country, and it ain't gonna work worth a flip. So you, you just have to. You just have to do it and see if it works, and then if it doesn't, see what you can do to make it work. And if you find, if you like it, use it. Okay. And it's just some pictures of of different uh, just different ways people have have have, uh, have built. Okay. Here's another. This is one using this. This this takes into consideration the toroid in here, okay? Uh, because you have that, it, like a, this is like the what the, the metal in a transformer, okay? And uh, so this is just this is more or less this <clears throat> the way this is is more or less how that's made. Okay, um, and that's what's that's what's inside this. Um, this one is a one to one. Both both of these are one to ones, um, and I'm not sure this one's any good. <laughs> I haven't, like I said, it it was up. You can tell by the rust, uh, and I took it out for some reason. And that's a, that's the same way. That that one's got a got a uh, a rod down the middle, which is kind of the what we're looking here diagram. Uh, and that it, that has to do with how 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 well the impedance transfer is and so forth. Uh, that rod makes it a little uh, more effective. 
Uh, all right, here's, uh, I would say this is a nine to one. Because you've got a 450 ohm unbalanced load to a 50 ohm balanced load. So if you multiply that 50 ohms by nine, it comes up to 400, 450. <coughs> So that would be a uh, that would be an excellent antenna uh, for for a horizontal loop, but you end up you end up with that here. Can you imagine hanging that in the middle of your loop? <laughs> it would probably reach the ground at some point. Yeah. Because to get the power that you need on that, like for me running an amplifier, then you have to use the big toroids. I've even, that's what that was made out of. Uh, and you can get all size, you can get all size toroids. Um, there's two that somebody has glued together to get the effect of the, yeah, of the iron in there. Uh, some of them are painted and some of them aren't and this one's pretty heavy it, it, because it's got a lot of metal got, got a lot of the the uh, and then you get something like that that's still a that's actually used inside a radio and somewhere in in there for some transfer of RF somewhere uh, so I wish that I had, we were in a place that I could have brought a radio up and, and showed you how these work, but uh, I'm afraid to do it in here. I don't know what kind of I don't I don't know what kind of sensitive equipment they might have in this building, uh, computer wise and everything else. I go throwing stray RF around up here. Who knows what it might do? So I just I don't I can't just can't do it. Uh, oh, this must be in. I guess so. Uh, so, yes. Does balance just mean it's grounded? It's grounded in the RF side of it, not to the not to ground. There's two types of ground in radio. Okay, you have uh, electrical ground, which is uh, what you the wire that you attach on the back of your radio and run the ground, mm -hmm. that's an electrical ground. That's to keep you from getting shocked. Right. If something goes goes bad inside the radio and puts hot AC on the chassis, then you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't get shocked. Then there's RF ground. And RF ground is it can be straight to ground. Like in his vertical that he's talking about. You can, on certain frequencies, run the other half. Well, we're going to talk about verticals here in a minute uh, and di dipoles. Uh, uh, you can run it to ground, but that's RF ground. Uh, if you don't run it to ground, if you've got a dipole up, you've got the hot side and the ground side. And that's the RF portion of it. And that's... Uh, that's different than a than a um, uh, an electrical ground. Okay, so these do not need to be grounded, although they can be, depending upon their use. That uh, infed wire ballon needs to be hooked to ground because the way the ballon is designed in there, that this. Well, let's go back. Like here, see that one shows it could be grounded right there. Doesn't have to be, but it could be. It doesn't have to be grounded to work. The the the, the part of the circuit is how these how these windings are connected. And if we go back a little bit further, you see here this one also shows possibility of ground, but the connection here, A and B, which is connecting those these two windings, 
right here together is what the radio is looking for RF wise okay and uh, if you're using it if you're using a if you're using a bound, well, you don't even need to do that. Uh, if you're using it as a choke, you don't ground it. The windings and, and everything, the way it's set up, chokes the, R, chokes the RF off of it so it doesn't go past uh, that point. So they do not have to be grounded. They can be, depending upon their use, uh, they can be grounded. I, like I say, I've got I've got two of these running. One of them runs one of them runs a hundred and forty foot wire, and the other one runs a two hundred and sixty foot wire. Okay, they are grounded, but they're grounded to a. Uh, I'm on the second story, so down and around probably twenty five feet, thirty feet of ground wire. Well, that's not that, a long ground wire is bad. There's too much resistance in it, and RF and all that stuff is going to go to the point of least resistance. So in this case, it gets goes out on the coax right here, on the shield of the coax, which causes RF in my shack. Okay. Now I eliminated a lot of it by disconnecting the AC ground, letting them float on the AC side of it. That took a lot of took a lot of the R, but didn't take it all out. I had to go and put chokes in there to choke off that RF, and then I could hook my AC ground electrical ground back up. So it's uh, RF is a RF is a is, is a funny 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 uh, current, I guess is the best way to say it, and. Uh, uh, if you ever, <laughs> if you ever get on a microphone that's metal, and you're talking, and your lip just happens to touch that microphone, <laughs> and you got RF floating around on that radio, you'll know it, and you won't do it again, because an RF burn hurts, and uh, so, and it burns from the inside out. It's kind of like your microwave. That's what microwave is. It's RF, but it's at a microwave frequency, so it heats up the molecules and whatever you put in that machine and uh, gets it hot. Matter of fact, that's what I got to do when I get home. I've got a, I've got a infection in my eyelid, in my this little edge of my eyelids right here, so I have to put a hot pack on it. <laughs> so I wet a washcloth, stick it in the microwave for about thirty seconds. And it comes out steaming hot when it gets cool enough that I can put it up there. I put my <laughs> up there, uh, hot pad up there. So it just, it, it, it excites the molecules inside the water and everything and heats it up. And that's exactly what RF is. And uh, so that, uh, why do you think the front of that microwave got all that looks like a screen in there? Well, all that is in there specifically to catch the RF so it doesn't go out. And, you don't put your hand up there and it cook your hand, you know. All right, let's uh, let's talk about let's talk about some. Let's see if I can find. Uh, let's see if I can find. There we go. All right, we're going to talk about the difference between vertical and a dipole. Vertical is probably one of the easiest antennas to put up. If you don't have a bunch of trees and, and all that stuff, and uh, they work pretty good, uh, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I was never a vertical proponent uh, in years past. Uh, but I, I. I mean, let me. I'll tell you what. Let me shut this on the light off. I bet y'all can see it better. <coughs> Now, so for field day operations, a whole lot easier to go out there and throw a couple of verticals than it is to try to find trees to string dipoles between. You got first off, you got to get the string up in the tree. Uh, 
I don't have any trouble with that. I got a I got a device that'll do it. But uh, anyway. Okay, here's a half wave dipole. So from from here to here is a half wave. Uh, that's where that formula 492. If if you're uh, going to do a uh, horizontal dipole and 468, if you're going to do a a uh, inverted V divided by whatever the frequency is you want. To answer your question about or to, to illustrate, if I were to take if I were to take this and take it over here and over here and come back, I'd have a horizontal loop. You see where you see that? If you use an open wire feeder line or 450 on that line, well, that antenna starts right here and goes out, up, 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 over there, and back down. So that's where that 450 ohm ladder line would, would add to that antenna. Okay. So what you have here is a quarter wavelength on each side. This is the balance side, that's the positive side. Balance side, this would be the unbalanced side going into your radio. This is the positive and this is the negative of that circuit, okay? And that causes, well, we go. This shows the, this shows the, the distribution of the current. So what happens is when you transmit the max, ah, come on. The maximum current is where? Right here in the center. Where do you put your ballon? Right there in the center. So that ballon is going to cover, or is going to uh, have the maximum amount of current on that antenna will be right there in the center. The voltage is at a minimum. And the voltage out here is, is hot, is where the maximum voltage is. You can see that's the positive side, and this one is the negative side. So if you go and grab the end of that antenna, you're probably going to get shocked because uh, because of the voltage is out there. If you grab it in the middle, you're going to get an RF burn because that's where the current is. Uh, so that's the dipole. Dipole. Two poles. Positive and negative. That's the half wavelength. Ah, got a bunch of them. Got a bunch of them. And this is how to figure out what the signal strength is of of a dipole. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not even, I'm not a mathematician, so I'm not gonna mess with it anyway. This is how this is how the the radiation from a dipole is. Okay, <clears throat> it's a, kind of a figure eight. So we can deduce from this, this figure that off the ends of that dipole, you're not going to get much signal. Transmit. So that means the dipole is, is directional. If you, wherever you, wherever you point it, that's where you're going to get the maximum signal. So if you're putting it up at your house and you got just two trees, you're stuck with the maximum signal going whatever direction those two trees are. And this this kind of shows you if you're looking down the wire, that's how the RF signal comes off comes off the wire. It really looks like, kind of like a donut, really. If you, if you really look at it right, it looks like a donut. Okay, it tells you vertical antennas. Yeah, it's not very, very readable. I'm sorry. Quarter wave, there we go. Quarter wave vertical antenna. It, uh, you got. And if you look at how the voltage distribution is on that, that's the positive side. And you got the negative side, and it's connected to earth or ground. 
that's the negative side of that antenna. If you look at it in the coax, the positive, the, 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 the positive side is going down the center conductor of that coax. The negative side is on the on the shield. So, uh, and that works best with the low frequencies. It does not with the impedance between these two right here gets too high as you go up in frequency. So it's not good above about 40 meters to run it directly to ground. You can get by with it on 40 and 80, 160, but uh, 20 meters and above, it's not, uh, it's not the best in the world. It will work, but it's just not very efficient. So what do you have to do? You're gonna put up a 20 meter vertical. What do you have to do? You have to run radials. Okay. Uh, that's just RF measured. In other words, uh, you got to know, well, you don't have to know. There's no way to know. It's very hard to find the velocity factor of number 12 copper wire. I have looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and have never found a place that said this is the velocity factor of number 12 electrical wire. Because electricity don't care. They don't care about velocity factor. Uh, if you're measuring a piece of coax and it says this piece of coax needs to be a quarter wavelength, RF wavelength. <clears throat> well, you've got to know the velocity factor of that coax. Because if you mathematically say, all right, I need a quarter wavelength at this frequency and do it mathematics, it's going to be, say on 20 meters, it's going to be 16 feet something for a quarter wavelength. But if you make it out of coax, and that coax has a velocity factor of 0.66, then you have to multiply that physical length by 0.66 to get the RF length, and it'll be shorter. So, that has that new radius, because you don't know what the velocity factor is of, of whatever wire that you're going to put out for radio. All we need to know, all we need to realize is that gives if this is a coax, and that's the center center conductor, so that's your positive, and the shield, the radials are on the shield, then that's going to match. That's going to make this antenna look like this. Uh, well, let's go back one. It's going to make that antenna look like that. Ah, wrong button. This is the vertical side because that's that's uh, attached to the center conductor of the coax and everything else is connected to the shield. That's the negative side. If we go here and look you can see the you can see the, the, the voltage and again, the current's still going to be maximum right there. Still, the current, current voltage is going to be the same. But you use radials. So the big question is now, what about on my car? I don't run radials on my car, and i got vertical antennas on my car. <clears throat> well, they just happen to run to the body of the car, and the antenna is satisfied. It has a... It has a it's going to ground and it's up on the 2 meter 440 range or a 2 meter range. It works. Maybe not as efficient if they were standing off of the top of the roof about 3 inches and had radials going out. They probably would be a, a, a little better and the tuning of that antenna would probably be a little bit different. Maybe a little longer than, or a little shorter. I don't know which. So basically, what, what I'm getting to is that there is no real difference in a dipole and a vertical antenna. There's still two halves of that antenna. One with the vertical, all you're doing is sticking that 
uh, transmitting RF emitting part of the antenna is standing it up and hooking the rest of it to ground. Radio sees it and says, oh, I love it. And of course, if you use radials, it gets even better. <clears throat> and if we had the opportunity, and this was field day, and I'd run a class this past field day on verticals and, <clears throat> and so forth, uh, but if I had the time, we could set up a vertical and we could run wire out, just any length wire, and it would work really well. You can get the SWR down pretty good by tuning the, the length of the emitting part of the antenna. Then if I went around and cut each one of those wires to a quarter wavelength, the tuning would be totally different. You'd have to go back and retune the, the vertical part of them. So it just it just proves the point that it's necessary to be what how you measure things and what you put out. Oh, well that's the end of that. So there's basically no the the um, let's go back. One thing you've got to understand. If that dot is the vertical antenna, you're looking down the top of your vertical antenna, down this way. That's the pattern of the RF. So another good thing about vertical antenna, especially on field day, is it's omnidirectional. It puts out the same signal strength all the way around that radiator. So that makes it good for field day. Because you're not stuck on a certain azimuth of where you're transmitting if you run it between two trees. Okay? Now, we can get in a little more verticals at some point in time. Probably I'll do another, another class on it next year. But uh, if, you put a, if you put a second vertical out here and you match it with the correct measurements of coax and so forth and so on, you can actually get a 3 dB gain going this way. And depending upon how you put that phasing line in there, you could have it go this way, maximum going this way, change the, what, the way the phasing line feeds, and the maximum will go this way. So you could change the direction of the two verticals. And if you fed the two verticals, uh, in the proper fashion, you could get a signal that looks like this to the side. So you would have two loads going out to that side. So basically you could turn 360 degrees with two verticals. But that's another class. Uh, and you have to have, you would have to have uh, an antenna analyzer that would be able to look at that piece of coax and tell you when you got the quarter wavelength. You can measure it, physical wavelength, and then by the velocity factor, you can get it to that length, but you're not exactly, if you're looking for a specific frequency, you'd have to have an antenna analyzer that you could put on it and measure the, measure the actual uh, uh, frequency that you're gonna cut it at. Any any questions? Well, that's good. That's good. I, let's see. Do I have time? I've got Six time minutes. for. I've got time for one more. I think if I got. I think if I got. If I have that uh, PowerPoint. <coughs> stick. Okay, yeah, let's do this. This, I think this will, I think this will be, we can run through this one real quick. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play, play any theory. All right, come on. We all talk about emergencies. We talk about going out and helping on bike rides and everything else. And you're gonna have, maybe in, a, in some cases, you're gonna have to put up some sort of antenna 
to, to be able to get back to where you need to go. So we'll talk about these real quick. This is mostly going to talk about our uh, HF. But, um, okay, we're going to look at the dipole antenna, the vertical antenna, and random wire. Okay, there's a quick representation of putting a dipole up on a tree or something like that. So what the only problem with that is, is, is in this case, the maximum uh, power uh, RF uh, uh, portion uh, is going to be towards me and towards away from me. Uh, coming out here to these, in this end and that end is going to, reception wise, you'll probably still receive a signal from that way, but your transmission uh, probably won't uh, be as strong that way. So that's a, that's a, but in a case of an emergency, you probably would try to put that dipole up back to where you're wanting to transmit to. Okay. Uh, that's another representation. That's a horizontal. And here's another quirk. The, uh, the impedance at that point right there on a horizontal dipole is about 72 ohms. And back in the day, when some of us old folks were doing this hobby with two type radios, that's what that load control was on the output of the final amplifier was to match it to either 50 ohms, 70 ohms, 120 ohms, whatever the type of antenna that you have. Can't do that with a transistorized rig. That's why they put tuners inside of them. And uh, they will match that and you won't have any trouble. But if you go much past 120, 130 ohms, it may not, they may, may not like it. Okay, there's an the inverted V now on the same thing. Right there on an inverted V by dropping these like that, you've lowered the impedance of that center impedance down to 50 ohms, thereabouts. Uh, if you do exactly 45 <coughs> degrees, you can get 50 ohms. But if you do 60 or 40, it could it'll change the impedance, but it'll be close to 50 ohms. Now, not only do you have maximum strength going this way and coming towards me, but because you have bent these down, now you do have some transmit strength improvement going this way. It's not quite omnidirectional, but it get, gets pretty close. So inverted B is really bit better than a horizontal dot. <coughs> uh, this is, uh, there's your 468, tells you what, what that ought to be. Uh, all this, all this is great information you can get on the internet. I mean, but there's ten thousand hits if you put dipole antenna in there, and every one of them will have a different opinion. Okay. Now you can't see this. Okay. Uh, that's a that's a vertical antenna. We just got some talking about vertical antenna, so you can see there are no trees. There's nothing there, it's just the, the radiating element sticking straight up in the air, which gives you what? An omnidirectional signal. That's probably the best, to my opinion, that's the, probably the best emergency antenna that you could uh, plan for. And uh, you can do it out of a piece of wire. You, you got, anybody remember the tornado that came through uh, uh, the north, that a subdivision out there north of Watkins back in December of whatever year it was. Uh, the EMA could not talk back to their headquarters from out there. So I took, I, I took, got me a piece of wire, maybe a two meter, screwed it on there, got to the flagpole, tied it on the flagpole rope, and we had communications back to EMA headquarters. Back then, it's called civil defense. That's how long ago it was. So, it's a great antenna uh, for emergencies, in my opinion. Uh, now, let's talk about a random wire antenna, and that's what that is. We don't know what we we really don't we don't know 
what that length is. That's why it's called random. There are certain lengths that will not work on certain frequencies. And if I was, I got it. I do have it, I think. Yes. And it's half wavelength. Uh, the half wavelength wire, random wire, and it's hard to tune. The, the input impedance of it is so high, it's hard, it's hard to tune. So this is, ah, these are, these are all of the, uh, <laughs> these are the numbers you ought to stay away from if you're putting up a random wire. And this guy that did this, he's a Canadian mathematician, and he went, went through there, and he came up, and these are the, these are the lengths, if you put up a random wire, they, it no longer becomes a random wire. This is a specific wire. These are the lengths that will let you transmit on all the ham bands. That your tuner ought not to have any trouble tuning it. Okay. Now, you've got to understand that, that this total antenna is this wire here and this wire here that goes down and hooks into the radio. So that's got to be included in that antenna because it's part of it. And they work pretty good. Like I say, I've got two of them up out, out at the, well, I have one right now. They're doing some construction and they, they had to take down one of my antennas. They took it down, thank goodness, I didn't tear it down. So sometime this, this fall, when they get through with the construction, I've got to put it back up, which is not a, not a big deal either. But when we moved into our new quarters out there, we didn't have a tower. So all we had was long wires. And that's the reason I put these two long wires up. One of them goes out this way, and one of them goes out that way. So that I can get coverage all around the compass points. Uh, <clears throat> and they worked great. And then uh, I got to talking to the fire chief uh, one well we had an open house after we got everything built and they got the everything set up we had an open house and I got talking to him at the open house and I I had a drawing that I had made in my head of how I would put a tower on top of that building and uh, I showed it to him and uh, he said well come here come show me so I walked out on the roof and right there and I showed him as a tower go right here and be attached to the building, so forth and so on. And he said, do it. So we put up a 30-foot tower on top of the building. <clears throat> so, and the, the beam that I use has a 40-meter add-on kit, and most of, our, most of our, our transmitting that we do on the Mars frequency is on a seven megahertz frequency. So we don't use the wires anymore. I could take them down, but, uh, I decided that we have so many other frequencies that we might be uh, our our particular our particular wing uh, has five five frequencies from two point I mean three point three up to about sixteen megahertz that we could uh, you know they could have us on so I uh, kept the wire so we'd have something that, that we could uh, transmit on if we if the beam that we have up wouldn't, wouldn't work. Which is what they did on us uh, uh, Armed Forces Day a couple years ago. They gave me a 15.993 frequency, 16 megahertz. Well, the, beam wouldn't, the beam would not tune 16, even though it was a 20 meter beam, it would not tune 16 megahertz. So I had to, I had to make a dipole antenna to spring up for Armed Forces Day. With a slinky, what's the advantage of a, that versus a slinky? Using a slink, what's the advantage or disadvantage of that versus the slinky antenna? Uh, well, of course, we really don't know what the what the actual distance uh, here is. Okay, uh, it needs to be the shortest 
If you're going to operate all of the ham bands, it doesn't need to be any shorter than 70, about 72 feet. If you get down, <clears throat> you understand that <clears throat> your tuner, whatever tuner you use, either it's in the radio, an external tuner, automatic tuner, manual tuner, whatever, tuner will tune a longer wire easier than a shorter wire. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Right. Well, let me add. So, on 80 meters, say 80 meters is the lowest you're going to transmit. Uh, a quarter wave wire on 80 meters is approximately 62 feet. Okay. Now, because a slinky is a spiral, so would you be measuring the distance of the spiral or actually the distance the of the long, slinky? The long, okay, I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the slinky part. Stretch it out as far as you can. Okay. The further you stretch it out, naturally, if you if you measure it, every one of those turns is six or eight inches. So right. if it's all right here, it's still wire-wise, electrically-wise, the same length as it is if you've got it stretched out, okay? RF-wise, it's going to be different. The more compact it is, the harder it is, it's it's going to look like a short or short antenna, right. okay? So, uh, as long as you can stretch it out, the better. Okay. Uh, but it, you, you could probably, I don't know, have to close, close up what slinky's about this big. Yeah. So, if you take that by, the, well, there's one on each side. There's two. Yeah. Up. You know, you could. You just got to get the, you, you, naturally you don't want to pull it straight, the way the wire is straight. It's still going to have, right, the loops, you know, but as you, that's a coil. And as you spread the individual pieces of that coil out, the impedance drops. So as you pull that slinky out, this impedance out here that the radio is looking at is going to get lower and lower and lower and lower. So you're going to get to a point where the radio is happy with it. I don't know about the performance. I don't know about the the radiation pattern and all that because I've never I've never used one of those slinkies, so yeah, I really don't know. I want to try for field day. So, but uh, it uh, you know in here it ain't gonna work. Maybe on two meters it might, but eighty meters no, nah, it ain't gonna work here. So you're gonna have to stretch it out, and the further you can stretch it without damaging the antenna. If it's like the slinkies I had as a kid, if you get it too far, it never goes back. Yeah. You know. So, same thing with uh, B and W. I believe it was B and W came out years ago with a tape measure antenna. Had two, basically two tape measure, and you pulled it out, and it, it was marked just like a tape measure was. So you can mark it 62 feet, be right on 80 meters. And uh, I, I never used one of them, so I don't really know the, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you any performance uh, data on it at all. But that would have worked a lot better than the slinky antenna, because you, you don't have the coil effect that you're gonna have no matter what you do with that slinky antenna. So that's not a benefit then. Do I? That's not a benefit of the coil. No, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and it's and like I say, the resonant point of it's gonna, it's not gonna be the same as a piece of wire because of that, those turns. Because mm -hmm. no matter where, if you long as you've got those turns, there's gonna be some sort of impedance created by those turns mm -hmm. or whatever. So, but again, I go back to it antennas like that you know play with them until you get to where it works like you want it to work or you're satisfied with it and use it uh, an antenna a radio is no better than the antenna that it's hooked to you can go to Yesu right now and one of their their top line radios is about fifteen thousand dollars it's got filters here and filters there and this and that 
all that good stuff, but you stick it on a you stick it on a clothes hanger, it is not gonna do well. You're gonna be very disappointed. You can go and buy an old Kenwood 520 tube model and put it on a real nice beam antenna or a good dipole and it'll outperform that $15,000 Yesu on a coat hanger. The difference is the antenna. Radio is a radio. That 520 works exactly like that expensive Yesu does. Exactly. When you get right down to the brass tacks of RF, they're the same. Just the way, different way they do it, and all the different stuff they add. It's a nice, pretty display that shows you all this different stuff and everything else. All that is, all that is uh, glitz as far as I'm concerned. I don't have a radio that's got a, got a uh, display on it at all. Uh, I had one, never used it. Never looked at the display. Of course, that's probably because of my old school training. Uh, I'm not saying anything against them. Uh, I suppose if I had the money and wanted to go out and buy a new radio nowadays, it probably would have a display on it because that's all I'm having anymore. Uh, I think about the only one that doesn't that's out there right now is the Kenwood 590SG. It's still no display. You go up to the five to the to the eight eight ninety. It has a display. So they, it, it, it's like it's like everything else. Uh, they they add stuff to it to make it attractive to the person that's buying it. Uh, and it it has its use. I mean, if you want to, you can sit there and look at that display and say, "Oh, there's a signal down here." Well, by the time you tune down there to it, that signal's gone. So it's not, you know, I had a, I had a, uh, I had a uh, add-on spectrum analyzer on one of my Heath kits that I bought, built. And uh, it was nice, man. I could see all that stuff. But like I said, by the time I got down there and tuned up and then tuned the radio up to that frequency, the signal was gone. Now, and I realized some of these digital uh, modes now, that, that 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 those displays are very very useful, and uh, but uh, since I'm not a digital person, I don't uh, I don't I don't go that route anyway. All right, it's quarter till. Everybody says they need to get out of here quarter till, so they get downstairs and get get their favorite chair. So I'm done. Thank you. Next you. month. Next month. It's the last class for the year. I'm going to do a soldering demonstration, or we're going to talk about soldering techniques and that kind of stuff. Now, I don't know if I'll have a second uh, something to go to because that may not last a whole hour and a half. Uh, but we may, I may have something that I can fill in with if we get through early. But we're going to talk about soldering iron, soldering guns, uh, different kinds of soldering irons. Uh, a little bit of, we'll do a little bit on technique and uh, uh, so that you can at least solder two wires together. All right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hal. Thank you.